Okay, so now we're still going on this role play thing, categories of role play, which give you ideas and brainstorming about how to use the doctrine you know in order to grow faster. This particular category is thinking like God. Now, your typical baby Christian who's too dumb to live thinks it's arrogant if you play God. He doesn't understand that the whole purpose of the spiritual life is to think like Christ. That's what John 17 says, that they may be one even as we are one. Now, how are you going to become one with anybody or anything until you how do you want to call it? Have the same thinking. Okay, well, how are you going to get the same thinking if you don't practice it like piano? We have this book of God's thinking. We're supposed to learn the book. We all know that. But we have no clue why. Oh, it's a holy book and I'll be holy if I study it. No, you won't. you only be holy if you learn it for the purpose for which it was given. And that's something only the Holy Spirit can do. He knows how to turn it into holiness inside you. You don't. You can memorize it in Hebrew, Greek, English, whatever translation from now until Sunday. You can spout it off all day long. See, a lot of scholars, they, they can spout it. And they mistake that for real knowledge. It's pathetic. Being able to know the specific words and the syntax and the prepositions and conjugations and all that, that's only the beginning. That's like ABCs. To be able to have it memorized and analyzed as far as far as that verse, that's like kindergarten. You don't really know the Bible until you can add up the concepts that it represents. When you read the story about Abraham, what do you learn? Oh, everybody will say, Abraham sacrificed his son. Do you have any clue what that means? Do I? Not really. So what do we got to do? Go to God. Okay, God, what were you thinking when you did this? What does this story mean? Then you, every time you ask a question to God, you get a little more of the answer. And you do it day in, day out, day in, day out, with everything you do. That's why I keep stressing this. When you do your email, when you're sitting on the toilet, when you're going to the bathroom, or the dishes. Because then you get in the habit of asking God, and every single time you do that, you get part of the answer. And you do it day in and day out, minute in and minute out if you can. So that it becomes an instinctive habit like breathing. And over time, some years, I'm not sure how many years in your case. In my case, it took, I don't know, 30. It was about 10 years ago when all this stuff started hitting me. You'll have this fluency of a relationship with him. And you begin to know how God thinks because you are beginning to think like him. That's the theme of 1 John 3, which the Holy Spirit just threw into my mind. We shall become like him. We shall see him as he is because we shall be like him. Okay, but you don't have to wait till you die. The oneness prayer of John 17 is realized by the mechanisms in 1 John, the epistle of 1 John. That's what it's about. How to have fellowship. That's the whole purpose of the letter. I think it's in 1 John 1.5. 1, Every letter always tells you very early on the purpose of the letter. That's You've got to study every letter in its own context and then how it branches out to other parts of the Bible to know what the writer means by what he says. Now, you know, we all cherry pick our verses and there's not a whole lot wrong with that because the principles each time. But if you want to hear the right context, you've got to understand a letter in its own context. Okay. Then you start learning to think like God. Now, God has a very definite personality 
that I tried to cover to some extent yapping most high. And as you come to know this personality, it's going to freak you out. At least it does me. He is so different from Christian portraiture of him. He is so different from what I expected him to be also, because I was just like every other dumb bunny believer once upon a time. But I can't live without him. From a very early age, just life stopped meaning anything to me. I wanted to die when I was still, what was it, 12 years old or less. I didn't want to live anymore. And the only reason I kept on living was because he exists. I didn't see any reason for my existence except to see him. So in that sense, I've had a lot more time to play with this than maybe you have. Okay, but we all get started somewhere with God at different points in our life. And it's not one person better than another because one person's been in it longer. It's quality time, not time in grade. Some people have been believers for 50 years and their, their, their knowledge is kindergarten. So it's not a amount of time. But it does matter when you get, like, I don't know, on fire to know God and forget the rest. Who cares about Christianity? Who cares about religion? Who cares about your fellow Christian? Look, honey, Christ saved you, not your fellow Christian. Your relationship is to God, not to people. Okay. But people aren't left out. They're secondary. And this is the irony of the whole thing. With God, everything is full circle. It just amazes me. Here's the, here's the key to him. He loves mating opposites. And to him, it's a mating. And that analogy is very, very um, literal. He likes joining opposites. It's very, very meaningful to him. I mean, the human counterpart would be thrilling, exciting, even orgasmic. But of course, with God, everything is way above that. He doesn't want to be God if he doesn't do this. The very process of every, every second, of every thread, of even a hair's breadth, of stringing things, joining them together, you know, kind of like, I don't know, I, I, this, I don't identify with this, but this is more like the kind of process God gets into. Pretend you liked building model boats. You know, the ones they put in bottles. That's a very painstaking procedure. You have to be really patient. You have to be really painstaking in doing it. It's like that in the sense of it doesn't matter how long it takes. There is no expense spared. It doesn't matter how hard or stupid it is. And of course, you know, you got the other end with the Terminator. Bam, 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 bam. Well, he likes that too when it's appropriate. But he's in for all of the kinds of Every single kind of human endeavor where the human is actually interested in the process, all of that, if you were to add it all up together, would give you a glimmer of an idea of God's, what do you want to call it? His desire. He's the master chef, the master accountant, the master creative person. He loves putting it all together. And he sees the end from the beginning. So it doesn't disturb him that there's this longness to the process. He's not ever, you know, like losing time. Because the end is always in view. It's one big now to God. Omniscience means everything is one big now. A billion years from now, a billion years ago. It's all the same moment to him. So what he's doing as far as our experience of time, in this moment, in your body or mine, 
He already knows where it's going to lead, and he knows all the what-ifs where it could lead versus where it will go, and all the things that can't happen or won't happen. And that's all part of it, too, for him. He loves the way everything fits together. That's Romans 8, 28. And he sees it all as one big thing, and yet each punctiliar dot of it, like a moment in time, that whole moment is always in context of a whole to him. And he loves that moment. He loves the slowness of it, or the fastness of it, or the intensity of it, or the boredom of it. Whether it's failure or success, because it's truth. There is a truth about a thing that never happens. That's truth. The truth is, I will never be a man. That's a truth. It's a truth that will never happen, but it is still a truth because it will never happen. It would be a lie if I said, well, yes, I will be a man. That's never going to happen, so then I'm lying. But the truth is, I will not be a man. You will never be an orangutan. That's a truth, too. He, he loves the way he fit all the truths that he declared to be truths together. It's like a big puzzle. And he loves the picture on the puzzle box. And every single moment in time is like one puzzle piece. And, and he, he just, he loves that process. Now, this is the hardest thing about God to accept. The thing that trips Satan up still trips me up too. He absolutely, really, truly loves righteousness. He loves it. It's not, you know, when we talk about loving righteousness, we're thinking in terms of I'm a good person if I say this, or I'm a good person if I do this, I'm supposed to love righteousness, but we don't really love it. Let me give you a difference of example. Think of your favorite food. A food you love so much you wish you could eat it all the time. Pretend for the sake of argument that was chocolate ice cream. Most people like chocolate ice cream, so I'm trying to pick something common. When you eat chocolate ice cream, you're not busy thinking what a good person you are. You're thinking about how wonderful it tastes. You're thinking about it, not yourself. If you're thinking about yourself at all, you might even be a little guilty feeling because you're eating chocolate ice cream and, you know, society says, oh, that's fattening. You're not supposed to like what's fattening and full of sugar. Who gives a flip what society says? But in your heart of hearts, oh, it tastes so good. And that's what you're thinking about. Get to God, righteousness tastes good. He's not for righteousness because, oh, I'm a good person and I'm God because I better be righteous. That's the way we think. That's not the way it is to him. It tastes good. Batamt. That's Hebrew or even Yiddish. It's also the name of some herring I really love. I love herring. Now, honey, I promise you, when I'm eating herring, I'm not thinking about how good I am or how rightful I am. If anything, I might feel a little guilty because herring is expensive. Oh, but man, I'd die and gone in heaven when I've eaten that brand of herring in particular. Tasty. Batamt means tasty. Righteousness is tasty to God. He loves the taste of it. Now, if you love the taste of something, you're willing to go to more trouble to get that thing that you love the taste of than for something you don't like the taste of. I guarantee you I will not go to any effort whatsoever at any time, even if I were starving, to get lemon meringue pie. But I'll go to a whole lot of extra effort to get peanut butter or liver or spinach or the other foods I like. And you got your favorite foods that you'll go to a lot of trouble to get. That's how God feels about righteousness. And feel is, you put the word feel in quotes because there's no such thing as feeling in God. It's way higher than that. It's a constant knowing. 
constant desire. That's not a feeling in him. It's an attitude. Attitudes are way higher than feelings. Feelings come and go. Attitudes don't change. Not in God. So he really loves that taste. It's a taste kind of love. Okay? Think of a food that, oh man, I, if I can't have this food, I don't want to live. I just don't. Sorry. That's how he feels about righteousness. And the Bible describes it that way. As a taste. All the Levitical sacrifices. It talks about the pleasing smell. That goes up to God. Isaiah makes a big play on the up to God meaning of the sacrifice of Christ as a smell going up to God. In Isaiah 53, he's always playing on the sound for God, which is ale, and up to, which is spelled differently, but it's ale. Sounds the same. Isaiah's always playing on that sound in Isaiah 53. It's really hysterical. But that's what, that's the point of it. It smells good to him. It tastes good to him. That's why he likes it. That's why he loves it. That's why he gives everything to it. Righteousness and truth go before you. Psalm 89. Psalm 138 too. You put truth above your own name. Because it tastes good to him. He loves it. The way you or I would love a good meal. I mean, we're talking, you know, we're ta it's kind of like, it's not exactly the right term, but it's the closest thing we got in human terms. It's like something that you're addicted to. That you just don't want to live without, and if you have to go without it, you have even, like, withdrawal symptoms. I don't mean, you know, like chemical withdrawal symptoms, it's psychological. You just have to have it in your life. Like, if you rip the color red out of my life, I don't know what I'd do. I have to have red. Just got to have it as a color. I'm not happy if I don't have red around me. So you can see I'm addicted to red. I'm also addicted to computers as much as I hate them. Certain other things. Now, that addiction is really psychological. Can I live without red? Of course. Can I live without computers? Well, technically, no, because it's my job, but I could have another job. You see the point? It's something you want so badly, you tell yourself you can't live without it. But you really can. You just don't want to. That's the way he, as it were, feels. It's his attitude, his static, present tense attitude. Present tense of duration. Aorist, active, indicative. A moment of time, divorced from time, therefore timeless and never changing. Not, you know, the, I don't know if you, you call it Gnostic Aorist. Gnomic Aorist. Okay? The idea of something that is always true because he wants it to be. He's omnipotent, he can change any time. You know what? He's never going to. He loves the truth. He loves righteousness. He loves justice. Like you or I would love something we're addicted to and don't want to live without. It's not at all the way we think about righteousness and justice. To, the, to us, really, those terms are distant and they're things that we ought to do and we ought to say we approve of them, but we really don't like them. If you really loved righteousness, you would never do anything wrong. Except when you made a, a, a true mistake, like, you know, you tripped over a banana peel. You would never willingly do something wrong, ever. Just because the sin nature is in you doesn't mean you have to sin. You can sin or you can eat peace. It's not a sin to eat peace. You always have a choice between a sin and a non-sin action. 
And why do we sin? Because we want to. If we really loved righteousness, we wouldn't want to sin. And the more you know about how God thinks, the more you know, uh, the more righteousness is actually attractive to you, and the less the sins related against it don't attract you anymore. I mean, when I was in my 20s, the whole, you know, sex thing, drug thing never hit me much, that the sex thing did for a little while. It was attractive to me until I started to figure out how it was ripping me away from God. And to this day, I remember saying to him, this is separating me from you. I can't do it anymore. It was on a July 3rd. I had a long talk with him about it. I said, I can't do this anymore. I can't bear the separation. So I was choosing between it and him. In my mind. Okay? And, and it gets like that just about the thing itself. The righteousness... As you mature in Christ, righteousness becomes attractive of its own nature, like food you love, or I don't know how to how to put it, anything that you like to do. You like watching TV? Well, righteousness becomes attraction attractive like watching TV, your favorite TV program. It's not it, it stops being entirely about whether it's how do you want to call it? Right. That's the irony of it. It stops being because it's righteous. It starts being because it's attractive. The attractiveness of righteousness ends up becoming more important than the fact it's right. Because you develop a taste for it. Because the more you learn Bible, the more righteousness becomes attractive to you and unrighteousness is unattractive to you. Okay? You could sit me in front of a porn movie day in and day out, night in and night out with my eyes forced open, and I wouldn't be attracted to it at all. You know what I think when I see that stuff on TV, which they usually have for the obligatory 15 minutes so they can sell the film? It's, oh, how shallow this is. Two grunting people in sheets. Whoopee. It's shallow. And, of course, I happen to know what it's like to actually film something like that. There's absolutely no romantic idea going on between the two actors because they got 16 people standing around them trying to shoot the shots. So it's not attractive to me at all. I didn't think that way when I was in my 20s. I'm nearly 60 now. Now all I see is, boy, how shallow. If this is humankind's idea of happiness, I don't want it. It's too mindless. It's just a bunch of grunting. Feel, feel, feel. Whoopee. Ooh, ah, ooh, ah. Okay, done. It, I just, just doesn't even seem romantic to me. Okay, but I didn't think that way 20 years ago. 30 years ago. I wasn't like that. So you see, it grew. I didn't, I didn't set out to make it unattractive. I didn't like the fact it separated me from God. But I was still, I still had all those motives still going on. But what kept, it was like this barrier. It's going to separate from me from him, so I don't do it. But I was still attracted to the whole sex thing. But over the years, it, I just forgot about it. Because I got more interested in Bible and that just sort of crowded the whole idea out. And a lot of stuff has happened to me since, and it it doesn't last five minutes, two minutes, even in my sleep, you know, because everybody has those dreams. And even the dreams have died out. It just doesn't interest me. And that's the way it goes. Righteousness, the more you learn the Bible, the more you see God... I don't know, it's like his thinking is infectious. And the values that he has, you end up having. And it's not because you're trying to be good. It's not that that motive ever dies, it just takes. It just becomes real secondary. Now this role playing is really important, and that's what we're really talking about here. See through God's eyes. What is a thing look like to him 
And the answer is, he loves it. He's all in it. it he's all, you know, I don't want to, he's, he's totally in the moment, so to speak. Okay, then what does he see? Role play that question. What do you see, God, when you see me doing this email? What do you see when you see me, or you see the television program that's being watched, or you're cleaning up the house? What does God see? Try to see through his eyes. Now, I want to say it was like 15 years ago. I put that on my refrigerator to remind me to role play that. And a lot of the times when I ask the question, I, I, I still draw blanks. I don't know what I'm seeing. But asking the question, you get a little bit of the answer, even if you don't know you got a little bit of the answer. It all adds up. And the more you learn Bible, the more you can see through his eyes. That's the whole goal of John 17. And you don't have to die to get there. It's the whole goal of spiritual life, to see through his eyes, to become one with him so that it's, as it were, you're on the inside of him, looking outside through his eyes. So try to role play that through your day. That'll really um, accelerate your spiritual growth because you'll be looking at things, as my pastor likes to call it, from the divine view viewpoint. But the divine viewpoint is so often taught in pulpits as being this dry principle thing. And it's principle, all right, but it's not dry. He loves working everything together for good. He really enjoys it. It's like he's this master craftsman doing this tapestry one line at a time. And he loves the t attention it requires. And he loves the slowness of it. He loves the process of it. He knows where it's going. And he's not at all upset about how long it takes. And I can't say I identify with him there. I do identify with him enough to know that that's what it is he's thinking. So you practice that same thinking, okay? Because now you know, too. And it might seem like a blur to you, but just go to God during your day. God, how are you seeing this thing? I want to see it the way you do. I want to enjoy it the way you do. And that doesn't mean you're going to feel good. Enjoyment is, is a, a mental process. And the emotions don't necessarily go along for the ride. The body's always fighting. So you're going to have lots of contradictory feelings that you're going to feel ugly and sinful and all. Forget that. Just practice it. What are you seeing, God? Try to see it. Okay? Because he really, really, really enjoys it. And it's not an emotional enjoyment. It's a content enjoyment. It's a focus. And every time you practice that, you get a little closer and a little closer and a little closer and a little closer in seeing through his eyes. And that's the ultimate goal of the spiritual life, to be in him the way he's in us. Try it. Peace out.